Morning, everyone. Well, everybody just saw it, the six-minute video, which, by the way, was produced several years ago, back in 2012 by Coral Ridge Ministries. Yes, it was, and so many people have seen that video, and they have been moved by it, they've been inspired by it, and, uh, you know, it's been part of the life-changing Carol Swain experience because people who saw that video, you know, contacted me. It created opportunities to speak and share. And I would also say that when people come up to me, many times uh, after they hear my story, they have tears in their eyes, but it's not, you know, just black people, it's older white men and women. They say, your story is my story. Now we just saw the, the six minute video, but uh, flesh out. I mean, obviously that doesn't tell the whole story. What, what, what's missing from that video that our audience really needs to hear? Because you've really spent your whole career uh, facing the challenges of culture, uh, facing the opposition, um, and dealing with a lot of the things that we've been talking about uh, for the last couple days here at Kingdom Come. So tell us a little bit about your background that our audience needs to understand that really led you to pursue the things that you've pursued, particularly in the last decade. Well, I can say that part of what's missing from that video is that I married at age uh, 16. Uh, by the time I was 20, I had three small children. Uh, one uh, died of a crib death. And uh, depression didn't just start in my 20s, like uh, in my teens. I can also tell you that I was always a spiritual person, even though I grew up in a church. In a, I didn't grow up in church. I grew up in a house that was unchurched, but my um, great-grandfather had been a math Methodist uh, pastor. And, um, but I, as a child, I always, felt a sense of urgency that there was something I was supposed to do. And my mother said I was not like any of her other children. And I can remember as a child, for one thing, I suffered with uh, shyness. I did not get over the shyness until I had my Christian conversion experience in my 40s. So, um, but I was always spiritual, and so that meant I experimented with n New Age and Eastern religions. and. I'm working on a memoir, and I will talk about my journey, but my journey um, has been quite a journey, and I've had, you know, supernatural experiences that some Christians would feel uncomfortable talking about, but I know that there is a spirit world and that lots of people have things that happen that they can't explain, but most people don't share it because they don't want to be seen as, seen as crazy. And um, I intend to share, you know, the truth of my journey because it gives other people permission to share their stories. You're a tenured professor at both Princeton and Vanderbilt. T talk to us a little bit about that experience, uh, being at a very high level in some of the great institutions of higher education in America. Talk about that experience as a Christian being in both of those environments. And also talk a little bit about your exit from Vanderbilt. Well, I hate to disappoint you. I wasn't a Christian when I got tenured at Princeton. I was uh, spiritual. But at Vanderbilt? Not at I was at Vanderbilt. Okay, all right. I was at Vanderbilt. That's probably one reason why I'm not at Vanderbilt. Okay. But, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's what I want to tell you all. I knew that I was different. And, and I felt this sense of urgency as a young adult when I started college and I took my first course in psychology, I was afraid that I had this mental illness called delusions of grandeur because I felt so special. And then after I had my conversion experience, for the longest time, I thought I was God's favorite daughter. <laughs> and, and then I, later I learned that there were others. <laughs> but I had my conversion experience um, and I mean, nothing with me is easy. Like 1997, I had an experience in a medical hospital that led to my getting baptized in a little Pentecostal church in Trenton in the dead of winter. There, there was a Pentecostal chaplain at the Princeton Hospital, and that's not a community where you get Pentecostal chaplains, but there was one there. And so I got uh, baptized in the dead of winter in a 
metal tub of ice water. And, um, and that sort of changed me some. I went to the church a, a little while, uh, but I was on, I, I, daytime, they were like you all, I went to an evening ser service and it was just too much for me. But I left there and I started blending Christianity, New Age, and Eastern. So I, it was almost like I had my own religion. Uh, so that for me, there was a journey. And the Lord kept sending people. So in 1999, while I was at Yale, that's when I became a devout believer. And I got rebaptized because at that point, I knew what it meant to be a Christian. I knew that my life had been given to me as a gift and that my life was not really even about me. And what the Lord did was he delivered me from a lifelong shyness. And my shyness was so crippling up until that point that during the time at Princeton, I had um, an opportunity to be on Good Morning America with my first book, the one that Claudine Gay plagiarized. And I was afraid I did not do that. I did not go on the TV show because I was afraid. But after I had my conversion experience, I um, started talking and I started doing media and I had no fear of cameras. And I didn't answer your question. I give you a fast a question. I, when I was hired by Princeton, I had a short list of schools. I got a signing bonus. I was a hot commodity, and it never uh, occurred to me that I would not get tenure. I got early tenure. It normally takes seven years. I got it. I went up in year three and got it in year four. And so I was like a superstar. That was before I was a Christian. And. Uh, and then after I got my tenure and I won three national prizes and, you know, all of these things, I did not get satisfaction from that. I was earning, you know, more money than I had ever earned in my life, and I was miserable. And that sent me, that sent me on the spiritual journey that culminated with my conversion experience. And so um, that came easy. When Vanderbilt hired me, you know, I looked good on the outside, but they didn't know that I was changing in the inside. And so they hired me in 1998. I went to New Haven and Yale to get a fifth degree. I had five degrees. And while I was at New Haven, I became a de devout Christian believer. And so when I moved to uh, Nashville and, and started my um, job at Vanderbilt, I was a new Christian, devout believer, on fire for the Lord, thought he was going to call me into the ministry. And, um, and I just thought, I knew that the Lord was going to pull me out of academia any day. Well, 17 years later, I left. Wow. <laughs> now, you brought up uh, Claudine Gay and uh, president, former president of Harvard. And uh, you mentioned there's so much to unpack just right there. Uh, she did plagiarize your work. I've often said that was the one right thing that Claudine Gay did was to plagiarize your work. She had good taste. She was smart enough to, to, <laughs> to, to do something uh, wise and, and to look at your work. But talk to us a little bit about that experience because I think for so many of us, we were, for those that followed the story, you have three presidents at the time. You had the University of Pennsylvania president, the MIT president, and then Claudine Gay of Harvard University. Uh, they're sitting before Congress. And in my opinion, they get a softball. Can you contend the genocide of, of, you know, of, the, is of the Israelites? Um, and neither one of them uh, could outrightly condemn uh, the genocide that we were seeing back on October the 7th. So talk to us a little bit about that experience, what comes out about Claudine Gay, and eventually her exit, and your role in that. Well, first of all, uh, the allegations of plagiarism against Claudine Gay started before that testimony. In fact, the New York Post had brought it to the attention of Harvard. Harvard threatened to sue the New York Post, so they pulled back. And so when Claudine Gay and those university professors could not condemn um, the anti-Semitism outright and, uh, and condemn, you know, threats of genocide, I would argue that that's because of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the, pre the pressures, because universities have set up all these different groups 
they have all these different factions on campus, and if you belong to the a protected group or of if you're not you don't <laughs> if you're not white, uh, if you don't belong to a group that's considered marginalized, then you get less protections. And so I think what they were trying to do, obviously, was not to offend the pro-Palestinian groups on campus. And the progressive groups make a lot more trouble, as you know, than the conservative groups. And so I think that they were strategically trying not to offend groups on campus that would cause them problems. So Claudine Gay, um, really, the other two presidents were a little bit smarter. They kind of caught on. Uh, they had been coached by the same attorney. So they were really uh, following attorneys' talking points. But you can have attorneys' talking points, but at some point you're supposed to use your common sense. And if someone is leading you down a path, then you got to figure out what's going on. Well, Claudine Gay did not figure out. She kept repeating the talking points. And so um, I think she, uh, embar not only did she embarrass herself, she embarrassed the university. And there are people who argue that the plagiarism, uh, that they used that, but it was really about the anti-Semitism. I think that um, she was never qualified to be president of Harvard University. If you look at her publication record, it was mediocre at best. And there are people who wonder, well, why would she plagiarize your work? I um, was a Democrat most of my life, and I was, but I always had common sense. I was raised, you know, in the country, and if you're raised in the country, uh, you're raised in the South, you have common sense. And so I was always a good thinker, I was a good uh, a, a scholar, but what she did was, uh, with my, her dissertation, if you read her dissertation, the topic and how she framed it, uh, she stole from my prize-winning book, Black Faces, Black Interests, The Representation of African Americans in Congress, and in her early work. And my work um, was considered the seminal work in representation because I argued um, that political party was more important than the race of the representative and that whites could represent blacks and blacks could represent whites and that your best representative might be someone outside your group. Well, what Claudine Gay was trying to do was to canter a work that was later you know, to be cited by the US Supreme Court my work was making an impact in the world, and her arguments, you know, was that blacks needed to be represented by blacks. And so that um, is why she would, uh, she would cite my work, but she would also uh, try to, her intent was to make the case that you've heard, if, you know, most people have heard that only blacks can represent blacks. I threaten, you know, that narrative that only blacks could represent blacks. And by extension, the arguments from my book on representation meant that men can represent women, women can represent uh, men, uh, and that your best representative might be someone outside your group. Uh, for those in the audience that might not be familiar with the phrase or the acronym DEI, what, what is that and how is it informing decisions in higher education in the West? Well, uh, the title of this, uh, this um, this discussion is The Adversity of Diversity, and that's the title of a book that I published last summer. And uh, it's about diversity, equity, and inclusion. A lot of people don't know that diversity, equity, and inclusion is, is really a layer on top of affirmative action. And if you understand the 1964 Civil Rights Act, that Civil Rights Act prohibited discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, uh, religion, and, and sex. And that was the law of the land. Affirmative action itself was never a law that was passed by two houses of Congress and signed by the president. It was three executive orders that at any time any president could have written an executive order eliminating it. And it set up the environment where and, and, and the Civil Rights Act itself led to outreach uh, for people who had been uh, shut out. That included women as well as racial and ethnic minorities. And jobs were advertised for the first time. 
and it was about equal opportunity. And I would argue, and I do have a chapter in the book, The Adversity of Diversity, that I benefited from the non-discrimination, equal opportunity, and outreach that came out of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And it led to an environment where companies, uh, universities, colleges, uh, they sought talented minorities. So initially, it was talented minorities who were being sought. With diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's all about group identity. And we've reached a point where the talented part fell out. And so it's all about now, it's about bringing in people who hold a certain perspective. And so diversity, equity, and inclusion is not like the, we look around this room. We look around uh, this congregation, it's very diverse. Uh, and you look around in nature, there's diversity everywhere. God is a God of diversity. There's nothing wrong with diversity. Diversity itself is positive, but when uh, progressives talk about diversity, they're talking about groups. They're talking about people who come in, they maintain their identity. They, they have to espouse a certain narrative and if you belong to one of those groups and you're not espousing that narrative, they would say that you're not really even a group member. And then equity is not the same as equal opportunity. Equal opportunity, you had an equal opportunity to succeed or an equal opportunity to fail. I have encountered many people over the years that had opportunities uh, to succeed. Uh, whether you succeed or fail depends on what you do, your effort, uh, but also probably your intellect and, and various things that happen, but you have an equal opportunity. Well, equal opportunity has been thrown out the window. Equity is very much focused on equal results, and so they have changed um, what it's all about. And then inclusion, the era that I grew up in, we focused on integration, and so you wanted diversity. You wanted people to come in, and we all worked together for the same mission. We were part of a team. Uh, the U.S. military used to be uh, held out as the institution that got it right. And we always looked to the military because that was a place where you could start at the bottom, you could work your way up. Well, inclusion is about bringing in people who belong to particular groups, and you're supposed to maintain your differences as opposed to being integrated, becoming part of the whole. And so one of the problems with uh, diversity the way it is being implemented in America through DEI is that it doesn't um, lead to integration and people being part of the team, and it creates a lot of conflict. Would it be fair to say it's reverse racism? Well, I mean, reverse racism uh, was immediately, uh, once you started using racial preferences, uh, in 1974, there were lawsuits about um, reverse racism against whites and the conflict around race-based affirmative action that happened based on affirmative action, but the civil rights law itself prohibits discrimination on account of race. And over the years, many white people have felt that they didn't have any civil rights protections. They thought civil rights was something for racial and ethnic minorities but all Americans are protected by civil rights laws and by the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. And as a consequence of the DEI environment that we are in today, more and more white people and you know, more men, because men are targeted because they are male, uh, are, are, are recognizing that they have civil rights and they are exercising those civil rights and they are filing lawsuits that are being resolved in their favor or, um, or, 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 or settle, sometimes just, just filing the complaint. And one of the most prominent examples involves Starbucks. One of their executives, uh, a white woman that was unfairly dismissed, she was a supervisor, she was successfully able to win a $25 million lawsuit based on racial discrimination. You mentioned in your previous answer, The Adversity of Diversity, your new book uh, that came out a few months ago. What's the book about and, and what led you to write it? 
Well, when the Supreme Court took the um, Harvard and University of North Carolina college admissions cases for Asian students, um, students for fair uh, ad, uh, admissions filed a lawsuit against those universities for discriminating against them on the basis of race. I knew that if the Supreme Court was the Supreme Court, they would have to uh, look at the Constitution and that based on the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause, they could not continue to allow race-based discrimination. So I actually started the book as soon as the Supreme Court took those cases, and that was a gamble because like 90% of the book was written before the court issued its ruling, and so I was like on pins and needles because had they not struck down race-based affirmative action, my book would have had to have been rewritten substantially. And so it was like, whee! <laughs> so, uh, the, but what the book argues is that diversity, equity, and inclusion programs violate the Constitution and our civil rights laws in the same way, and that these programs cannot, you know, cannot and should not be maintained because they discriminate against people based on their race, their, their sex, their gender, the sexual orientation, and by sexual orientation, I mean whether um, I'm talking about heterosexuals versus homosexuals. Uh, in some places, you find heterosexual men being discriminated against, uh, white and black men being discriminated against because they're male, and um, the DEI that we have today just totally, in most places, violates our laws. And when you look at the uh, DEI officers that are often hired, usually, um, in many cases, there are people that have, you know, they come from some of the majors. Maybe they studied ethnic studies or something like that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with ethnic studies, but sometimes they get hired at corporations, they get hired at organizations, and they are positioned where they are actually guiding decisions that impact the well-being of the organization and the organization's mission, but the individuals themselves may not know anything about what the company does or why it was founded. Part of what I argue in the adversity of diversity is that we can do better. Uh, we can have unity, and that should be our goal. And we, um, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with uh, employees, and certainly business owners need to know the Constitution's Equal Protection Clause. They need to know the, the laws, the civil rights laws protecting people. Everyone needs to know uh, the law of the land, but when you're hired by an organization or when you work for a company, that organization or company was founded for a particular mission. And what has happened is that organizations have, uh, have been led into a path where they're trying to do social engineering Social engineering should not be taking place in the workplace, and you don't need people, DEI officers, sending out emails celebrating special days. I don't think anyone's special day should be celebrated, other than the, you know, the major holidays that we all recognize. But apart from those holidays, when it comes to particular groups, the work should not stop to celebrate someone's um, special day and people should not be forced to participate in activities that offend their conscience. Yep. Yeah, uh, Christians get two days, Christmas and Easter, and it seems like uh, Pride Month uh, seems a little uh, out of balance, correct? And, and even uh, it's not, every month, someone's celebrating something. Seriously. It is. And for myself, when I think about Black History Month, like black history is American history. You know, if you... It, <laughs> but but once you go down that path, there's an endless number of groups yeah. that stand yeah. up. They all want to be celebrated. And if you're trying to do equality, then you would have to celebrate all those groups. No work would get done. <laughs> and so... <laughs> We really need to just go back and simplify things. And when it comes to organizations, that classic 
organizational literature that some of you all read, may have read in school, or you, you brought in people who were experts on organizations and building healthy teams. That's the literature that you, uh, those are the kinds of things that would be productive for organizations. You don't need people coming in and uh, dividing employees and trying to retrain them and the problem with diversity, equity, and inclusion is that it's, it's, it's related to critical race theory that argues you know, that America is systemically racist, that all white people have privilege, even the white people in Appalachia, maybe they never finished uh, the third grade, they come from these impoverished families, that somehow their white skin uh, gives them advantages above a person that might be the offspring of a black, you know, millionaire or a black professional. Uh, these types of things, uh, people are told that all racial and ethnic minorities are victims. I am no one's victim. And, <laughs> and, and the problem with uh, telling racial and ethnic minorities that they are victims, uh, it can disincentivize hard work because for myself, I always had a can-do attitude. Like I was, uh, my personality was that if someone told me that I couldn't do something, I was certainly gonna show them I could. <clears throat> and so to me, when they said I couldn't, it was throwing down the gauntlet. If I was a young person today, the messages that we sent, send all of our children, especially racial and ethnic minorities, I'm not sure that I would have been motivated. You know, maybe I'd be in poverty in southwestern Virginia. That would not have been a Carol Swain story if I had not believed in the American dream, if I had not been told that if you worked hard and got an education, you could make something out of yourself. But the emphasis was on you making something out of yourself. Those are the messages that I believe motivate young people uh, not telling them that they are victims of a, of a system, uh, that is very destructive. And anyone that's doing DEI and you think that's great for your company, you're making a mistake. And DEI uh, and critical race theory, they have seeped into um, churches, uh, just about every institution in America. They are destructive and they need to be rooted out. Amen. <clears throat> What do you say to the person that pushes back and says, Dr. Swain, you're Christian, an African-American woman living in the 21st century. Diversity, equity, inclusion, um, ending racism, aren't all of these things Christians should be pursuing, particularly a Christian that's an African-American woman? Aren't these Christian principles, racial reconciliation, diversity, equity, inclusion, what do you say to those individuals? Hey, honey, who told you that? <laughs> where, where did you learn that? Uh, because this, these are things we want. We want diversity. And you we have, want racial reconciliation. Well, you know something? Uh, as far as I can see, you have some diversity in this congregation. Are you running a DEI program? Nope. <laughs> And, and when I read Revelation, uh, it, it talks about, uh, you know, the people who are stand before Christ will be from every tribe, tongue, and nationality. And the Christian world, what we do have is the Bible, and we know that God is no respecter of person. And from one man, he made every nation of men. And so we are supposed to be leading the way. Christians should be, be leading the way. And... For many um, people, if you're black, you know, you hear about slavery, 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 but you don't hear the whole story, uh, the fact that the first people that came to America in bondage, they were indentured servants, they served, and they uh, learned skills, they were released. They became, many of them, part of the free blacks of America who are the most wealthy, the Martha's Vineyard types. And, um, and slavery initially, uh, it, it was not permanent initially. And then for a while, if you converted to Christianity, you were released. And so over time, you know, it became permanent. But there were black, Native American, 
and white slaveholders. And as far as the black slaveholders, I think there were about 3,000 uh, that held slaves. And so it's more complicated than what we are told. And keeping, using slavery as a way to divide people or to make excuses, if you actually look at the data, the blacks that came out of slavery and the ones in the early 1920s up to the 1950s, the black family uh, structure was very much like the white two-parent structure. Um, th th the dysfunction that you see in black families now where 70% are headed by single females, all of that came out of the 1960s. All of that came out of uh, that era, you know, when the world turned upside down. 1962, prayer was taken out of school. 1963, Bible reading. 1968, no fault divorce. So when you look at the dysfunction that you see in America impacting all families, whites and blacks, a lot of that has to do with the social engineering that started in the 1960s. Even the crime, the explosion of crime associated with black inner city neighborhoods, all of that stuff was not the case in the past. What do you say to pastors and ministry leaders? Because we've heard it a lot in the last four or five years, uh, that to, say, to solve the racial divide in America, uh, that we can no longer say that Jesus is enough, that the gospel's enough, that the word of God is enough. What do you say to those pastors and ministry leaders? Well, some pastors and ministry leaders don't act as if they know the gospel and the Bible. And when it comes to Christianity, you know, it's not just a feel good, it, love everybody and they'll love you back. Uh, you know, Jesus said to follow him, you have to pick up your cross. And persecution is something that if you live in a genuine Christian life, there's no way everyone's gonna love you. And it's not uh, any way that your whole family, that everyone's gonna be on the same page because a true follower of Christ there is division. There's division within families. And often I see uh, situations, and you know, it happens in just about every church, that there will be solid Christians that will have a biblical worldview on homosexuality, for example, until it's their child or their grandchild. And then all of a sudden, they rethink Christianity. They rethink the tenets. And that is very sad. And some people think the loving thing to do is to accept anything. So your child comes home from college with their boyfriend and they want to sleep at your home. Um, and you don't want to offend your child? Or are you concerned about the child's uh, salvation? Because a true believer of Christ, the most loving thing you can do is tell them the truth. These are life and death issues. Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, I see, this happen I see this happening all the time. Uh, it, it's the compromise. And the, the Word of God is not to be compromised. And unfortunately, I feel like the church in America has failed in so many ways. And progressives have studied Christians. And if you, um, uh, if you read, um, uh, you, if you understand cultural Marxism, uh, if you read Cleon Scalson's The Naked Communist, one of the goals of communists was to take the gospel of Jesus Christ and to turn it into the social gospel. The social gospel is about doing good works. It's about not offending people. And so there's some churches that are really into good works, uh, and those churches are not really um, t teaching, preaching, living the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you may know the scripture offhand about uh, like wide is the road and narrow the path, narrow is the path, that everyone is not going to follow Christ, and and many Christians are just too compromised. And this thing about Christian nationalism, that's a progressive way to prevent Christians from being involved with voting their values and acting on their values. And I very often tell people that. There is no political solution to what ails America because we know, those of us who know the Bible know that no man-made solution is gonna solve all of these problems. But at the same time, we're told in the Bible to occupy until Christ returns. We are also told to pray for the welfare of the state or nation or wherever we uh, reside. 
And so we have to stay in the game. We have to be involved. But at the end of the day, we put our trust in God and Jesus, not in uh, politicians or political solutions. And we don't pull back and just let them have it. And you may think that you can protect your family. Uh, you know, you send them, you know, to a, a, to a Christian school, solid Christian school, like the one you have here, or you may homeschool them. You cannot insulate your children and grandchildren from the world. They have cousins, they have neighbors. They're gonna uh, interact with people from the world. There's no way you can prevent that. The only thing you can do is prepare them with the right values and principles, instill it in their hearts so that when they confront the world, that they will know, you know how to respond. The other thing is that some of these issues that you're trying to protect them from, you need to sit down and have a conversation about uh, what the world says because you don't want someone else introducing your child to something you haven't talked about. I love it. Uh, that, yeah, let's give her a round of applause for that answer. I just want to public, I've thanked you privately, but just publicly thank you because you are such an important voice in this cultural moment. Um, even just clarifying that last point, that the gospel is our only hope, that the word of God is sufficient, uh, that the message of Christianity is the greatest movement the world has ever seen, and it is the power unto salvation. Uh, but it is also the power for reconciliation, and we need to continue to champion that message, and so grateful uh, that you are on board as a senior fellow for the Institute for Faith and Culture, so con con uh, consider you a true friend, a uh, con uh, true ally, uh, as we continue to engage culture for the kingdom of God. Let's give Dr. Carol Swain another round of applause. I just want to say one last thing. Thank you. I just want to say, I just want to say that this ministry, this ministry and this church is so important for our nation. And uh, it's making an impact. And D. James Kennedy Ministries, you know, like the vision. This vision is being carried forward by Rob, but, you know, never, ever underestimate what's happening from this church that's impacting the rest of the world. So be encouraged. Thank you. I'm honored to be here.